Hello again. In this episode, we are going to address the question, how do you turn a negative into a positive? This is so crucial for people to learn because life is full of negative experiences and sometimes people will get into a state of depression for days and weeks and months when they can just flip the switch and turn a negative into a positive. So I'm going to give you a formula that you can use to take any negative in life and turn it into a positive outcome. And frankly, when you learn this, you could be a best-selling author by sharing your wisdom with the world because the world loves usefulness. So here is a formula. I'm going to take you through the first five steps of this seven step formula on how to transform negative experiences into positive outcomes. I find that when I have a negative experience happen that I need to sort of reassess. And the first thing I do is a gratitude assessment to identify what you're grateful for. And as the scriptures say in Thessalonians, rejoice and pray. Sometimes I have to uh, realize that I have to be grateful for sometimes the negative experiences because in retrospect, some of the uh, greatest lessons in life I learned was from the bad experiences. I mean, how many of you have learned more from your bad experiences in life than the good ones? So don't take the victim role and say, poor little me. Say, oh, okay, well, uh, whatever your belief is of a higher power, uh, your creator trusts you enough to be able to throw you this curved ball and help you become strong by overcoming this negative experience. Number two is to gain the proper perspective. Keep the big picture in mind. What can I learn from this? In the eternal scheme of things, this is just a small moment in time and I can get through this. In other words, this too shall pass. Third is you deal with crisis, deadlines and insults with faith, hope and charity. And so as I have any crisis happen in life, I realize that if I get fearful that faith and fear cannot occupy the human heart uh, simultaneously. And I have another episode on that where I show you how to deal with crisis with faith. And uh, if I'm fearful, it means I'm not exercising enough faith. Now, faith without works is dead, but you deal with the deadlines looming over you with hope. And I don't look at it like a deadline. I look at it like a lifeline, that this deadline is actually the beginning of a new opportunity. And then if there's offenses or insults, I choose not to take offense. I go, you know what? They probably didn't really understand my circumstances. And so I forgive them. I offer charity because most don't mean to offend. We choose to take offense and that's just hurting me. Once you deal with crisis deadlines and insults or offenses with faith, hope, and charity, you move into number four, which is being able to understand why our people, now you get out of yourself instead of me, 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 victim, why are other people feeling in similar circumstances confused, isolated, and powerless? And as I share in other episodes, you give them clarity, confidence, and capability because that clears up confusion, isolationism, and powerlessness. You do that by providing leadership, developing relationships, and using creativity. And you can view other episodes to understand how to apply that formula. Now, the fifth here is you see the opportunity in the challenge or the threat. This is the game-changing difference because when you see an opportunity and you're getting out of yourself, when you help other people get their canoe across the pond, so to speak, your canoe gets across the pond. So the story I like to tell is uh, that of uh, Brett Livingston Strong. So let me share with you one of my favorite stories about how to change or see the opportunity instead of the threat in any negative situation. So this story took place back in 1977. I graduated from high school in 1970 and uh, back in 1977 in California, on Malibu, uh, that's a beach, there was a gentleman that built this beautiful home down on the beach. When he was finishing it, he looked up and he saw a big rock protruding from the cliffs above. And he thought, wow, that rock could break loose in an earthquake here in California. 
And so he petitioned the state of California to use taxpayer dollars to remove that rock. He perceived it as a threat. And he got all of his neighbors together to sign a petition and file a lawsuit eventually. At that time, there was a young immigrant from Australia, an artist by the name of Brett Livingston Strong. And uh, he was trying to eke out a living. He knew America was the land of opportunity, but it's very hard to start making a living as an artist and make a name for yourself. He's in his little humble LA apartment with a black and white TV. And this story was the number one story on the news for three weeks. And he's quite amused by this because Wow, uh, in America, you can sue the government to remove something that was there before you were? I mean, in Australia, if, if there is a rock or a tree, it takes precedent that he said, this guy built a home, got a building permit, knowing the rock was there. The rock was there before he decided to build a house. So he was sort of amused at this whole thing, but everybody was making a big deal and it was named the Malibu Rock. Well, who was going to win? Finally, California gave in. They usually do. This is why their taxes are so high. And so Brett Livingston Strong went down to watch because Caltran uh, was hired, of course, to move this rock. So on that day, the dozers and the choppers were working and tugging at the rock all morning. And finally in the afternoon, it broke loose. It got away from them and it landed smack dab down in the middle of U.S. Pacific Coastal Highway number one. This is a 116-ton rock. And uh, the head engineer is going, oh dear, uh, rush hour people, this is really a major problem. Well, this is what's interesting. The geologists studied that rock. Two-thirds of the rock was still embedded so far deep into the mountain that a, an earthquake of six or seven on the Richter scale wouldn't have broke that rock loose. It was never a threat. What everybody thought was a threat was not, but Brett Livingston Strong saw it as an opportunity. He walks up to the head engineer and he goes, sir, I would like to buy that rock. The engineer says, you can have it. He said, oh no, I, I want an official receipt. I'll buy it for a hundred bucks, but I don't have a hundred bucks. I got, I got one dollar on me right now, down payment. He says, it's yours for a dollar. Brett pulls out a dollar. The engineer hands him a receipt. Okay, buddy, you own the rock, you move it. You pay to have it moved. So Brett went down to a shopping mall and he said, you know what? The publicity's already been done. Number one story on the news. Everybody knows about this. If you'll pay for this rock to be lifted with a chopper, uh, I will lease it to you for let's say three grand a month for six months, put it in the center court of your mall. People will come to see this rock and you'll sell clothes and ice cream and hot dogs. And sure enough, the mall management did that. It was the best thing they ever did to bring people to their mall. He did it on one condition. Then under a canvas with hammer and chisel, he could go to work on the rock and this would create attention also. While he's working on the rock, he is creating an image in this rock. Six months later, he's ready for the ceremony to unveil the rock. All three major news net networks are there and he gets a man dying of cancer in a wheelchair uh, at, from an Orange County hospital to come and view this. He unveils the rock and in the image of that rock was John Wayne, the Western cowboy movie star. The man in the wheelchair was John Wayne. He leaned back and he goes, I like it. Brett Livingston Strong sold that rock for $1.1 million. He took $1, six months of work, and turned $1 into $1.1 million because he saw an opportunity instead of a threat. Now, some critics go, oh, he only netted about 850,000. Who cares? He had all kinds of art projects lined up because he had more opportunities the rest of his life than he had the capability to seize. He could choose which opportunities to seize, which ones to delegate, which ones to walk away from. That is the secret on how to turn negative experiences or what people says is a threat into an opportunity. And that's the key. So as we go through this, it's understanding how to solve and uh, overcome the dangers with new opportunities and seizing strengths. And then you can transform the experience and begin a better career. You can write a book. The world loves usefulness, and this will help you to be able to take your strategies, your opportunities, negative experiences, and turn them into better outcomes 
I almost look forward to negative experiences because what am I going to learn? How I, am I going to create intellectual capital? So if this is resonating, I would recommend you click on this episode to understand how this all comes together. But if you want to learn about this in more detail, I would recommend that you pick up a copy of Entitlement Abolition. This book contains stories like this, and I would love to have you get a free copy. You just click down here and you can get one shipped to you for $5.95 shipping and handling, but it's free and it will empower you with 12 chapters on how to learn how to take the, uh, the negative experiences in life and transform them into positive outcomes. Oh,